Uh, my name is Michelle Hun. I am the gallery <laughs> director and curator here. Um, so um, today is the second out of four programs in the Room 100 Foundations and Topics series. Um, and Room 100 is the spring 2019 project of the NYU Shopping Gallery. Uh, Room 100 is both the location of the gallery and this building, the NYU Shanghai campus, and also the title of this semester's project, uh, which is, uh, as you can see, not quite an exhibition in the gallery. Um, it's more of an experiment with the conditions of space, time, intention, desire, and need. Um, to ask ourselves as a community what could and maybe should happen in or for and by a university art gallery. Um, as some of you may already know, Room 100 has been open five days a week from 9 a.m. to 5 p.m. for anyone and everyone at NYU Shanghai to use as they wish with some conditions and provisions, as you can see, provided. Um, uh, meanwhile, at the gallery, we've organized two program series um, for the university community, a series of lunchtime programs called study sessions, during which we gather together for close looking and group discussions of various art objects that have been brought into NYU as part of our uh, temporary study collection as well as the discursive program series, which is called Foundations and Topics, um, to which we respond to certain fundamental questions related to art and its institutions, um, which all of us have gathered here for today. Um, tonight we'll consider the question, um, what can art do? Uh, focusing on the action of art tonight is perhaps an appropriate follow-up to our first Foundations and Topics program, which was only about two weeks ago, and that was with the Shopping Biennale Artistic Director and Chief Curator of the Muaf Museum in Mexico City, Fatima Medina, um, in which he responded to the question, uh, do we need a university art museum? And in this lecture, Medina shared with us the origins and actions of Muaf, um, the Museum of Contemporary Art at UNAM, which is the National Autonomous University in Mexico City, and what perhaps the University Art Museum is uniquely positioned to do. So in this context, we've asked a uh, multi-hyphenate tenure <laughs> uh, to respond and share with us the possibilities for an art. And if I can take some liberties here, as well as the art institution, uh, that might be more than an object of contemplation and reflection or for acquisition and collection. Um, but an art, to borrow the words of our other guest here tonight, Julie Chun, an art that expands the notion of art as a verb rather than a noun. And moreover, we'll consider not only the what and the how, but perhaps where and why and when. Um, so before we begin, I just want to introduce our guest tonight. Um, Chen Yun was born and raised here in Shanghai. She has curated more than 100 talks, performances, workshops, and social events. She was a member of the curatorial team of the 11th Shanghai Biennale, that was the previous edition in 2016-17, and curated 51 Personae, a public program series that revealed the transformational potential of 51 persons and groups in Shanghai. Um, this project grew out of her work initiating the Jinghai Chao uh, Mutual Aid Society, a self-organized venue for studies, communication, reflection, and social services in a working class migrant neighborhood of Shanghai. Uh, Chen's other work also includes West Heavens, which is an India-China social thought and contemporary art exchange project, as well as the UN Center of Traditional Art Training and Academic Institution in Suzhou. Um, following Chen Yun's presentation, she'll be in conversation with our other guest, Julie Chun. Uh, Julie Chun is an independent art historian and lecturer from the USA, based in Shanghai since 2011. She serves as the art convener of the Royal Asiatic Society in China, where she delivers independent lectures at art museums and galleries to widen the public's understanding of artistic objects, past and present. 
She lectures frequently for various foreign associations in Shanghai, including the consulate general offices, as well as being an adjunct professor of art history for the Institute for Study Abroad at Shanghai University of, of, of Finance and Economics, where her focus is on arts value to society and culture. She is also a regular contributing writer for Ishu, the Journal of Contemporary Chinese Art. Um, and so after this conversation, we'll of course open it up uh, to everyone here tonight and hopefully we'll have a lively discussion about what can art do. And um, following that, we hope we'll, you'll also join us in the hallway for a small reception of just some wine and small snacks. Um, so please welcome me in joining, uh, please join me in welcoming Chen Yun. Thank you. Um, um, good evening, everyone. I'm very happy to be here and invited um, by Michelle and also joined by Julie because they have been helping me in the previous um, months and years in editing my English translation of some of the texts that I uh, wrote on Ding Hai Qiao on 51 Personae because it's a Chinese, China-based and Chinese-based. Uh, project. It is very hard to have an English version at the same time while you're occupied by logistics and curatorial, uh, a lot of things, organizational, operational things. At the same time, you can have uh, an English version of this. This is like too luxurious for most of the local, local based art practices in, in China and maybe in other in non-English speaking countries. And this also limits the understandings and the first hand knowledge about what's going on um, uh, in, in this kind of forms uh, in, in other societies, non-English speaking societies. So I'm very grateful that they have voluntarily helped me to edit some of these texts so that at least we now have uh, some very small handful <laughs> of English available somewhere <laughs> in this world that um, maybe in the future some English speaking people can uh, will round into it. So I'm going to talk about one case of 51 Personae. So as introduced um, by Michelle earlier, uh, I started to work in contemporary art since 2007 after I received my master in Chinese University of Hong Kong, but in um, master of philosophy in communication because I was from a journalist background. So art was not part of my train, but I grew up. But can't say that so, um, uh, um, because it's not like that, because I have been a viewer of Shanghai Benali since 2000 uh, when I was in college. So Shanghai Benali has been a very important channel for non-art background people like me to, uh, to be approached from an art world and it's more welcoming than the other kind of exhibitions available at that time and maybe still today. Um, but Shanghai Benali by then was very different from what we see today in the art scene. So um, my um, work in the earlier involves, as Michelle talked about, uh, a lot of interactions with India since 2010 and why India and why India makes so much sense to me and why uh, I am doing this uh, today, which is very, very not quite um, mainstream, but it can become part of a mainstream art practice, but not quite so back in 2014. 2013. It is because uh, in my earlier years in India, uh, the Indian intellectuals, artists, they combine, um, they, they work together in a kind of format that I, I didn't see in China by then. Maybe it's still not quite so today in, in China. But uh, they are, first of all, they they are they can be simultaneously writer and artist and curator and activist. Um, so this is very natural to them. So this whole group of uh, in uh, Indian intellectuals have brought me many um, inspiration that uh, the Chinese scene at that time didn't, I didn't get. Because in 2007 and 8, that was before the Olympics, and then 2010, the Shanghai World Expo. So the, the, those were the high time of uh, China, Chinese contemporary art. But the Indian lessons that I learned had helped me to nurture um, another way to art and culture. Uh, as an independent worker or a worker of in this field that can collaborate with other people uh, who can, uh, these energies that you can address uh, through a certain form. So since 2014, after working on many exhibitions and projects with Indian friends, uh, I, um, 
By the way, West Heavens was, uh, was initiated by Johnson Chan, who is a Hong Kong curator and uh, uh, gallerist. Uh, so I have been employed by him since then. So at the same time, I developed gradually my own project, which was mentioned earlier by Julie, uh, uh, by, by Michelle on the Jing Hai Chao project. So that was, it was, uh, it, it was not a non-profit organization. It was not an art space. It was just a group. Uh, a group that can test on the different possibilities between people in, in, in a certain circumstances, which is not an ideal, what we would recognize as an ideal cultural space, but it is I, an ideal social space. It's, it's in a very, um, how, we, we would call it slum as, as, as framed by the government, but it is a certain um, society that is still quite inheriting, uh, ha has inherited the energies from the past socialist and pre-socialist, pre-revolutionary period to today. So this is how I uh, got involved into Shanghai Benali because the last session of Shanghai Benali in 2016 was curated by an Indian uh, collective called Rex Media Collective. So, um, so they naturally invited me to join the curatorial team. And they also proposed this idea of 51 Personae. Um, I, I then said that I would prefer to work uh, on 51 Personae, which is a 17-week um, long event, series of events lasting for the 17 week during the Shanghai Biennale, but outside, mainly outside the power station of art, which was the main exhibition. Uh, venue of Shanghai Biennale. So, so I somehow quit from the exhibition hall, but entered into the society again. But of course, with the kind of things that I learned in the earlier years while I was working in Ding Hai Chao. So I only have time today to share with you one of these stories, because each of the 51 stories are so long and so detailed. I, uh, I, I think this one can maybe give you some idea about how I think through doing what maybe can be called art or activism or whatever. Um, so this is a photo of uh, Jing Yunli. It locates in Hongkou area, which is in the north part of Shanghai, a hist historical part of Shanghai. And this house, along with the whole lane, uh, was famous to be one of the earlier left-winged intellectuals uh, residential houses in 1920s and 30s. Um, so um, just to mention that my first understanding of city as, a, as a, an object, as a subject to understand, comes from my master years when I was in Chinese university. I was asked to do a term work, a, a small research, uh, back in my own hometown city, Shanghai. So I was asked by Eric Ma, who was a cultural studies professor at Chinese University, to research on a street from Shanghai. And we collaboratively worked out uh, a book in, in September that year. So I studied uh, a street that is not very far today from Jing Yunli. In fact, it is on the same street. But at that time, I only uh, studied a street that was by them uh, transformed into what we call a cultural state street. We have this name called cultural, I don't know how it's culturalized or reculturalized or cultural historical street that the government at that time, and that was quite some time ago, we're already thinking that how can we reframe a street so that it becomes more outstanding for different reasons. Of course, for commercial reasons and for symbolic reasons and also for government re reasons. Uh, so I studied Dolun Road. So Dolun Road is the road that just next to Jing Yunli, I later realized. So this is my first encounter with Jing Yunli. But in fact, I picked up this street also because uh, my high school was not very far from that area. So 51 Personae, this is the website. Um, it's still, it has an English version, luckily, so you can still go visit this 51 Personae website. And this is how it looks like. It's from November 2016 to March 2017. And so these were the um, Personae's. Some, some, sometimes the persona is, park, is a corner of a park where people can go play, play uh, goal games. And sometimes it is um, 
a group of three um, poster paintings, movie poster painters. And sometimes uh, it is a film like Millennium Movie Go For Broke. It is a film in 2000 about laid off workers um, situation and but was later forgotten. So, um, and one of this is, uh, uh, and who just entered this room, in fact, I, yeah, Chen Wang you want to raise your hand? Yeah, yeah, because I just show her photo here. So <laughs> she just entered this room. Yeah, so this is my first um, uh, encounter with uh, Miss Chen, who was introduced to me through an artist friend who happened to be her tenant at that time, because Mr. Mr. Ms. Chen lived both in Minneapolis and Shanghai. So when she w she was away from Shanghai, she has a talent tenant. And at that time, uh, she happens to be an artist friend of ours. So at that time, we think mm, it's interesting uh, to to use uh, this case as one of the 51 persona because earlier in Dinghai Chiao, in this demolishing area, we also run into such similar cases. Um, so the the title of that talk, uh, of that personal event, we call it uh, a lady who refuses to leave. And uh, this is my first visit to her in 2016. So, uh, so this is how it looked like back three years ago. Uh, this whole area is all, 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 all already under demolishing. Um, and this is the artist friend, Elaine Ho, who has also been very, uh, how to say, <laughs> active, uh, active uh, social uh, engaged artist from Hong Kong, um, and this is Miss Tr Miss Chen who is um, preparing some tea. And this is I, this is a photo I took on her table. I realized that she she is an intellectual, independent researcher on local history because she is reading through. This is from 1987 and 1985. These were old journals on new cultural um, on new culture. What we call new culture movement is the left-wing um, cultural movement in the 1920s and 30s, which is very much related to this area, which is under demolishing. So Jing Yunli is one of these areas, but it will be preserved because uh, Lu Xun used to work, live there. And Lu Xun is uh, one of the most important left-wing inter intellectuals and also very sympathetic of the Chinese Communist Party at that time. Um, so this lane will be preserved, but the rest of the lane, the rest of the whole neighborhood will have to be demolished because Lu Xin didn't live there. So this is how culture was framed in the government's sense, because they want to have some symbols left, but the community is another thing, the surroundings and the daily people's living is another thing. Um, so because, because I realized that she uh, liked doing researches, so uh, this is a painting of a very famous Chinese uh, wood print artist called um, Zhao Yanyan. And she, she, he belongs to a younger generation of artists. But Lu Xun, when he was active, even before he passed away in 1935, uh, he used to be a very major promoter of the uh, new wood print movement because he see the uh, revolutionary energies by this form of art. So he has been very active in promoting this art, and he has been very active in gathering and writings and talk to these younger generation of artists, particularly in this form of art. So this is uh, Zhao Yanyan's work after Cultural Revolution in 1970s. When, in fact, when he recalled the Cultural Revolution eras, Zhao Yanyan used the stories, the famous novels written by Lu Xun in 1920s and 30s, and make a series of uh, very famous and very precious um, milestone like uh, uh, contemporary Chinese, modern contemporary Chinese wood print. And this is a photo that uh, Ms. Chen was showing me, uh, that she has already some idea what to do uh, outside her house is that we want to have this outside the house, a similar pay, uh, images. So finally, we selected four of them, and we printed them outside the these uh, facade. This is the wall, just uh, 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 outside the same wall that uh, belongs to her uh, her house, her Shikuman house. And there. Uh, uh, this is the entrance gate. This is this is written Jing Yunli, and this is where 
um, we put a portrait of Lu Xun, which is a most one of the most famous uh, wood uh, print um, portrait of Lu Xun, also made by Zhao Yannian. And this is uh, when we were working on these two facades. And I will come back to these two facades once and once again, because you will see the changes after, uh, after three, uh, in the past three years. Um, and this is another. Um, so this is no longer, because this whole wall is no longer. And this is no longer, because this is, after all, a temporary structure uh, inside the lane. So this is no longer. Uh, but. These two, because these are permanent walls, and because this belongs to Jing Yunli, so people, uh, so the government will not demolish it because it is kind of heritage also. So they preserved, but they have different. Uh, they also un have gone through different stages. So in the evening, we also invited other people from neighboring communities who unfortunately was, uh, or or um, who refused to go or who are still struggling. Um, they try to somehow negotiate through different channels to resist uh, the injustice uh, they feel they suffered from this negotiation with the government to remove them to and to, reloc to be relocated to some other places. Uh, so this is how it looked like at that evening. We have um, these people there from neighboring communities, like these people, and we have young people who were who come to to join this because. Uh, of our project or because of the Shanghai Binali. Um, and this was uh, one year after. So it was uh, March 2018 um, when the tenant of Miss Chen was uh, by force removed along with all the belongings of hers and of Miss Chen's um, to somewhere. So m mostly what the government do is they will m move you out. So if you refuse to talk to the government, uh, then they will use, um, f how to say, use violence, violence to uh, remove everything out. So you will be blocked. They will block the window as well as the door of the shikuman. So that it is, it's more symbolic, in fact, than real. Because later we pointed out that it's, it's more symbolic. It's more like a performance from the government's end. But we didn't figure out that at the first instinct, because you didn't believe that the government is only performing. Because you always think that they are the real, or <laughs> some real entity who is applying real uh, force, real uh, law. But in fact, it is not. So how we figured that out? Because one year later, which is this year, 2009, in February and 10th, when I arrived, uh, so in fact, I have been discussing with Ms. Chen. <laughs> this is another story. I will skip that story. But Ms. Chen feels that these bricks, these are hollow bricks, inner hollow bricks. It's not for constructing anyway, because it's very loose in structure. So it's more like a symbolic, easy way to make a wall. But it's not a real wall. It's a more symbolic wall than a real structural wall. So uh, when I arrived, they have already removed this. If you remember earlier, it was like this, right? It has been there for one year. And uh, Ms. Chen has been struggling, thinking about this. What's the meaning of this? And how can we re-find a channel to talk to the government and to solve this problem? And then what she did, along also with her friends, I think some of her, her friends are also there, is just to remove the wall by themselves. And it's, it's not difficult at all, in fact. And they just did it. And we enter this room, and everything is gone, in, including the air conditionings. So it is a very, um, how to say, it's a very abled group of people who have been doing this for uh, so many times that they know how to remove everything easily. The gas, uh, the, the power, of course, and then the air conditionings and everything. Um, and then it was two days after that, uh, I heard from Ms. Chen that uh, they removed the door. Because earlier, you remember, we still have this original Shikuman door here. Uh, and then someone come, and they remove the door. So then this becomes an empty, um, how to say, this becomes an, uh, accessible to anyone, this place. And so I come back and check how it happened. So it's interesting when I come back, uh, because now there's no door here for the gate. 
um, I was standing uh, with Miss Chen, and you will find that this door looks almost like a frame, because there's no door. Uh, so people will just show up from somewhere, mostly from here, and then they will look at inside because it's empty, and they will be very puzzled and curious, and then they will start to talk to anyone who is inside about what's going on, because there's nothing inside, there's no belongings at all. Well, at time, it's an empty house with no doors, and there's someone inside, so no, no one can refuse to, uh, can, re, uh, can control himself from talking to anyone inside, and they start to talk about their own stories, naturally, because anyone who show up here, they must carry some stories from their past, because this whole community is no longer. So there are some leftovers, or people who come back to look for some leftovers who show up, uh, except for this one, uh, who is very um, angry at us for no reason. And she, later on, we figure that he is, in fact, the new head of the demolishing team here. So everybody, good for good or for bad, they would just show up. So uh, then I realized that this door um, should, in fact, I don't know if uh, Ms. Chen still agree with me or not, but at that moment, I feel if we leave this door open, more possibilities will come up. Because Shi uh, Kuman, which is the very, um, uh, the, the academic term of this style of Shanghai residential houses from late 19th, 19th, 20, 19th uh, century to early uh, 20th century period, is a very special form of uh, Shanghai residential houses because it captures a lot of features of the traditional Chinese houses, but also uh, mingled with many westernized, uh, westernized housings. And it's, it's the name was named after uh, this gate, this door. So this, this door is the name of this form. And the most famous Shi Kuman is, of course, the birthplace of the Chinese Communist Party, which is still there in Xintendi, and the rest of the community becomes nothing, uh, only commercialized. But they have mem memorialized the birthplace of the Chinese Communist Party. And this is like now the, sim the most glorious celebrated Shi Kuman in Shanghai and most well-known Shi Kuman in China. But if we leave this door open, I personally feel that, I still feel it today, that this transformed the space naturally into something. We didn't open the door. Someone opened the door for us. And if we keep going on with this kind of format, then we will have the most open form of a residential house from the history of Shanghai that can serve the purpose of today. And what's the purpose of today? It's hardly can, it can hardly be defined by any single entity. It cannot be defined by the government of any levels. It cannot be defined by a curator or an artist. It has to be defined by the people who come up. Um, so this is a moment that I myself uh, fully uh, anticipated and fully enjoyed. Um, but unfortunately, because there are so many anxious to protect your own uh, private entity in this case, because this very, um, this relations with the government has been going on for two years. So it's very natural for Ms. Chen to think that I need immediately another gate so that the government will not uh, occupy it again. But in fact, the question is, how can the government occupy the space again if they will not demolish it? In fact, you need a lot of imagination from the government's end. It's a very big question for the government. If blocking is not possible, then how can you own a place? How can you really own a place, either as an individual or as a government? In fact, this is a very fundamental question uh, that I don't think the government has this wisdom at this stage. Um, so the following, in the next two days, in February 14th, I visited Shanghai Binali, and there was a work by these two Swiss ar uh, architects. Uh, I, if I, I don't remember, I don't know if you have visited this exhibition, but this is um, a, an installation on Oravia. Oravia is a small town close to Pondicherry in India, in South India, um, which was uh, constructed, um, built up 
uh, in 1970s by um, many countries from all over the world under the same philosophical idea of how humankind can live together. So one of the photos shown in this uh, complex of uh, artworks is this photo from 1971 showing someone, French-born certain Roger Ender, um, he built this kind of house, basic housing units for the new community of Auroville. So this is an attempt from, he didn't say that, we, we don't know if, what, he's just French born, it doesn't matter whether he is an artist, an architect, or whatever, or just a person. But he proposed this for Auroville. So I was thinking that, I, I don't think there's a door or something in this structure, or any way to lock it from, to, to, to lock it from the outside, to in any daily uh, interaction with the outside. So we need to rethink about privacy and private entity and all these things uh, from this example. Um, so this is how this place looks like today. So now we have this new gate uh, um, uh, invited by Ms. Chen. And now, now the anxious anxiety becomes how can we make sure that this building will be occupied by us uh, 24 hours a day so that the government will not do anything. But in fact, in fact it is a dilemma because I think, I don't know if Ms. Chen will agree me, with me or not, um, I think this, this is not going to be a solution because the game is set as such that you have something you own and then the government will offer you an exchange, an exchange of money, an exchange of some other house somewhere in the city so that you will be satisfied. But the primary reason that Ms. Chen didn't leave this place is not that the exchange rate is not good or I'm not satisfied with money, but that the reason that the government want the house back from a private uh, ownership to the government's ownership is, um, is not clear at all. And there's no channel to get the reason to, to have an answer to that question. So if we come back to this primary primary uh, inquiry, in fact, proposed by Ms. Chen in the whole process, that it is not the money or this deal that I want to talk to you. It is the reason that I need an answer, but the government cannot provide. Uh, then I think to leave this space as an open space to, instead of a castle or a kind of space that needs to be guarded against violence, um, I think the former, for me, is a more interesting, at least a more interesting strategy. But of course, if you think uh, the people who, how to say, legally still possess this asset, this, this house, and the kind of sufferings that the government has in, imposed on her, on her, it is not easy um, for the situation to be changed into another another way, saying I can, I can leave the place and I can still leave the place open and see how the government can regain it back. So uh, uh, and one way that we, I have been thinking about to continue such stories, in fact, none of the 51 personae stories ends after the Shanghai Biennale. It's not possible because they are all people who are still living. So we are following up such cases like Jing Yunli. And one of the ways that I do is, starting from last year, I try to develop 51 Personae as independent publishing projects. Because uh, now with the art two art fairs, in art book fairs in Shanghai, there's another way to present, to show, to exhibit, which is through uh, art publications. It, in, in, it needs your invest. Uh, invest a little bit, of course, because you need to find people to do this and you need to print it out. Their material-wise level, uh, you, you do have to invest money and time in it. But it is at the same time an exhibition on paper and it is a record on paper. It is something that can pass on somehow. Uh, it can be nomadic uh, instead of um, locality-based. So uh, we will put, although at that time we we don't regain Jimin Lee 7. And it's, it's still, I think this question remains open. Can anyone gain or own or claim to own a place as such 
uh, anymore, especially such a place like Jingling Li, number seven, who has had such stories. So we, we make the publishing address uh, Jingling Li number seven, although we don't go there and in fact, it's, at that time, we think it's a virtual place because we know that it's no longer in, in Ms. Chen's hands. But now it seems that it's back. But of course, it's, we, we, we have to say everything with a question mark. But it will be interesting if we remember this place, uh, which is not Jingyuan Li number 23, which was the former residential house of Lu Xun, but a Jingyuan Li number seven, which is which formerly was a was a um, private. Uh, it was before, in fact, Jingyuan Li was purchased by Miss Chen. It was a dormitory by of a local factory. So people who live there, they could be intellectuals and they could be not. But what matters most is to give a certain reminding of ourselves in our thinking about culture and art today. Uh, these kind of haunted places, they are haunted not only by a certain figure or a certain kind of history that could be symbolically reproduced, but uh, mostly there are life experiences and um, certain level of justice and certain level of potential and certain kind of um, beauty in it. So now we are using 51 Personae as a publishing collaborative. So each year we will produce, because due to the limit of our <laughs> time and energy, um, maybe a couple of new books. These, these books were contributed, written, or collaboratively written by 51 Personae team. Uh, those people who have participated or somehow gathered through that project. And uh, through publication, we want to make it self-funded. Self but it's very difficult because now, the, uh, despite for these two platforms, these two uh, art book fairs, there's no uh, formal channels, of course, to, to, to sell it, basically. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. So this is the end of my talk. If you have any questions, I'm very, be very happy to answer. And also, because Ms. Chen is here, so I think her friends can, will be also happy to share what they thought. <laughs> Thank you so much, Chen Yun. Um, I um, want to start the conversation going here, mostly because um, you, you and I have met through also interesting uh, uh, circumstances, and also the reasons that brought me to you. And that has to do with, I first arrived in Shanghai in 2011. And I had updated this just last night to include 2019, because a new museum, the Chao Bing's oil tank, had just opened. But as you can see from my list, most of the museum building took place from 2011, when I arrived, to roughly around 2015. And sadly, despite that we have so many museums that open, this is unprecedented than in any city in, in Europe or United States, and definitely here. What is, what is sad is that there's only two museums that I could walk in without paying. Every other, every besides the Leo Haishu and the OCAT, I have to pay money to go in. And some of the prices have been ridiculous. When I do a comparison, the, uh, some of the cost here in Shanghai is more than New York at MoMA, more than Guggenheim, more than LACMA. And so my question that, that led me towards my search to you is asking these questions. If museums are supposed to be for the public, who is the public? Who speaks for the public? On what authority? What is the viewer's reception? And does any of this matter? And so this has been a quest for me. But in order to distill it for the audience, Yun, can you um, share with the audience what has been your conception or your vision about what the public is when you started doing the 51 persona as well as your involvement with Ding Hai Chao? Um, 
So first of all, I think uh, this idea doesn't come as the first instinct, as if I know what is a public and what I'm going to do to create a certain public or uh, to look for a certain public. I think there's no such a thing before. Because um, earlier, I used to work for a museum, and I do public programs. Um, I think this is a uh, quite a natural, it's a quite established format, but it's, it's not very natural at the same time. Uh, you don't know why. When you set up a museum and you started to create a public in the museum, it's, it's already a selective process. Mm -hmm. So my understanding is that uh, if we ourselves don't become part of a public while we were gathering, then there will be no public at all. So for example, if we're talking to each other here and we are not quite part of the, of the kind of public that is mostly needed, the kind of uh, content that we're talking to, or they are part of the scene, they are part of the reality, uh, then it is very difficult to start. But of course, uh, another dilemma is that we can not at the same time be multi, like really multi, uh, multi identity as we think. For example, we cannot be at the same time, in fact, to be an intellectual or to be an artist, at the same time, uh, someone who we are engaged with. But this is something, is a, but this is a st to understand this and try to further understand this is a starting point to, uh, to create a public that we are also part of. So it's not a problem that uh, the public is not yet here or there or clear or not clear. This is not a problem. If we are uh, part of the public that we are working on with and we're not the dominating power at the same time, then I think something is going on. And I think this can very well be done by art uh, in today's context. Because there, there can be many forms at the same time, but art is definitely, I mean, in general case, art is definitely a very provocative way to doing it for many reasons. Mm. I agree 100% with you because in my search for that, I, I thought aside from these private spaces and even the public museums that the state had instituted, in many ways, it's its own sphere of private spaces if they are charging quite a bit. But so I had located all these places that are accessible and free of charge. Um, as you can see, there are open spaces of public parks as well as what we call autonomous and self-funded spaces. And exact, it's exactly what you say. These operate within a sphere of its own publicness. Some of them are more underground than others. There was a basement six that was started up by two American artists, and it really was party central, and it was literally in a basement. But it was by word of mouth and through this. But I think some of the challenges has been, and there has been some very interesting exhibitions as well as happenings that, that occurred in these spaces. But look here, aside from those that are in black, everything that's in purple have already shut down. Some of it has to do with funding. And some of it has to do with its uh, running a course. I think you and I discussed it at one time. We discussed how important or not important a budget is. And then we were talking recently, because I was in some ways lamenting to you about Ding Hai Chow, uh, in a sense that an organization you started, you're not as involved in that. And you had a fabulous answer for me. Can you share that? I don't know if it's fabulous or not. <laughs> But I mean, it's a different mm. dimension. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So earlier, Julie was very upset because she has been, as long, if you follow up such in alternative spaces long enough, you will also see their sh shutting down at some point. But I think this is not quite a problem because it is not about the form, because each of these forms took shape not to be perman permanent. Because if you want to establish something permanent, it is another way of thinking about things. And you have to take many things into consideration. For example, if you want to, um, how to say, like a state is permanent. If you want to have a, a kingdom or a state or government which is permanent, then you will have many things in mind, which I think which is not quite necessary sometimes, or even not the thing that these alternative art spaces are looking for. So it is on one hand very 
uh, reasonable for them not to be permanent. And also, of course, how long is long enough? Um, this is another question. Uh, I have also asked similar questions to other alternative spaces who uh, shut down even before Ding Hai Chao really started. I don't think it is a totally upset uh, situation because at the same time, you will foresee another, uh, another stage of life of the person himself on one hand, of those people who have involved, and also the space itself. So the space will become another thing. But I think the energy will transform into another shape and meet the need of the new time. But sometimes it will, be, it will happen that some time is gone and it's gone forever. And the, 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 <laughs> the good time is followed by a bad time. That's also possible. But uh, I think this is not the for me a sufficient reason to be mourning at. Um, but to, to see other chances going up in other forms is more and more important, I think, for every, everybody who wants to be part of a certain uh, stage. Mm. So that goes with our idea of public, the fact that it cannot be finitely or definitively defined, that it's a process of evolving. And along with that, many of these independent and autonomous sites of which they, they can take bold steps in order to explore criticality as opposed to the commercial aspects of, of private art institutions. So when you said that to me, it gave me quite a bit of hope in a sense that what I have to do is redirect my thinking of art as an evolutionary process and some of it I may not want it to shut down because it seems to offer such a counterculture to what's happening in mainstream art but in its own sense it's, it's going to continue to evolve. Um, I'd like to talk about this project because I just went recently over the weekend to the Rockland's uh, Art Museum's opening. Tobias Rehberger who's a very uh, high-profile German artist. How many of the audience members have been to Rockburn Art Museum over the weekend? Anybody? I couldn't believe it. I went to the opening on Friday night. Saturday, I went back in order to attend an artist talk. That's the first time since I've been here 27, the line was completely down Hu Lu, wrapping around to Beijing Donglu. I have never seen a line like that at the Rockburn Art Museum. It felt good to see lines because that meant people were engaged and they were very interested. But some of it, I was a little skeptical because there's a deli on the first floor. If you go to the Rockba, you'll find a deli with pig's head. You could buy all kinds of sandwiches, pork, and a lot of the young people were very excited and coming up to me and saying, oh, Julie, isn't this so cool that there's a deli in here where we can actually partake, consume, because art is a process of consumption. Artists make art through their creativity, and whether it's object-based or through performance, we as the public, we are consuming it. So it's a very literal aspect. And I told um, some of my young colleagues that were there, I said, well, no, this isn't that new, because in April 27, we had something very similar, but engaging the public to a greater local level. And of course, many of us in the art world know that the Thai artist, uh, Ricky Tervenia, he opened up a, a, a kitchen in a gallery in 1990s, and he was making curry, his uh, grandmother's recipe, and feeding the people, literally feeding. So for this, uh, we, I took my art history students, all American students, and we went to Ding Hai Chao. And one requirement that you set for my students, I still remember it, they were going to cook for the local people who lived in the area, but you said we couldn't bring any outside ingredients. Can you tell the public a little bit about the requirements? Yeah, for yeah, what? is uh, 
is the main street is a market street, which is a form that is diminishing in Shanghai, that you want to hide market in a certain shelter and organize it in a form uh, that make you feel comfortable to walk in and everybody feels safe. Uh, but this is still a street market form from maybe, I think it has already 70, 80 years old, uh, as a street market. Um, and it's very popular for local people to come because the things there are not expensive and it's very fresh because it's, it's close to uh, the water also. So um, I asked them to cook. They, they can cook, but they have to find the materials from the street. And it's, I, I want to see how it's possible. And in fact, the, uh, the students were extremely creative because one student wanted to make uh, basil pasta, whereas one student took the local ingredients. He took quail eggs, duck eggs, and made some kind of an egg soup. And the creativity that evolved. But I think the, the best thing for me was to see this engagement, level of engagement. One of my students said, as we were cooking, and as we hung around with the, uh, the local neighbors uh, who had lived there, one student said that she had been through some rough parts in Detroit. Uh, growing up, and she said that she would never venture out to a ghetto, and that's the word that they use. You used the word slum earlier. But she said that this was the most pleasant ghetto she's ever been to in her entire life because, I mean, they bought those hats and jackets from the local street people where they had used clothing on the floor. She said that she would come back here any time. And, and that also subverts this idea of, of public spaces that we're very fearful of, but within the, the perimeters of Dinghai Chow, there was no sense of violence, despite the fact that there were bulldozers and, and various um, uh, demolition going on. And so here are my students cooking, and they were able to share the meal, and as you can See, they had such a great time. Some of them actually enjoyed cooking. And so this idea that art is something that we consume, but within the space of Ding Hai Chao, the aspect of commercialism is, is one of the lowest priority. I think if you go to the Rock Fund, the deli, who is the sponsor, they, they're called Blackbird. And if you know who they are, they're a very high elite restaurant currently located in Columbia Circle at the heart of the former French concession. You can't get a lunch there for under 200, maybe even 300. But here we were able to feed the entire local neighborhood for 180 kwai that the students purchased all the vegetables and the goods from the local market. I hear that from some of the older Chinese that in the 1980s, especially from 1980s to about 1990s, the sense of freedom, whether it's art, literature, film, that they felt a sense of liberty and they feel that that has actually become less over the years, despite the fact that we've, we're now in the age of social media and the internet. What is your view on that? Mm -hmm. yeah, this is also one of the very commonly raised questions to me. As if I am uh, so avant-garde that I must be pioneering something that it should be very alert by the power. But in fact, I, I think it is not so. Because uh, um, either doing 51%, of course it was two years ago, three years ago, 51%. Um, we, there's always something that you know that uh, is quite sensitive when you have to take into consideration. But these are not very major uh, things. I think the major thing is still uh, if, you, if you try to organize anything uh, and hopefully that it will make sense. Uh, either it's a cultural event or art project or any gathering um, that involves others to participate. And you somehow think that it is public. It is a public uh, thing. It is not a private thing. Then I think you have to think about, not about censorship or all these things, but what is the most fundamental thing 
in, in your thinking about this? What is the most fundi- fundamental point in this case? And what, sometimes it doesn't come to you so clearly before uh, it happened. So if you create one of the 51 personas, of course I somehow know that it is special. But how special and how meaningful and what is the meaning uh, can only be told after it is over and sometimes after it is over for a while and for very long. Before, uh, maybe after you have lose the time connection, lose the energy connection with it, and then you will figure out that, oh, I now I kind of know why I did that. So, But sometimes if you don't have that uh, kind of tuition, uh, then it is very difficult for you to be a really creative people to organize things because then after a while you feel that it, this is just already in the basket of someone someone else's. So it is not something uh, that is pointing out um, a certain aspect of living today that should be uh, recorded or be recalled uh, or be remembered at least. Mm. So I think, I, I don't think uh, there's such big limit at on, on the things that I'm thinking about or the things that I'm, I'm organizing, um, because the width uh, talking about it, it's it's maybe the sensors will come uh, into a certain scope, but in fact the depth uh, is is very important. Okay, well on that note, because this is a forum about public and about public art and public dialogue, I'd love to open it up to everybody here. We'd love to take questions, comments, responses. Um, and please, don't be shy. This is a discussion. And I'd like for everyone to participate. Comments, responses. Yes, <coughs> Michelle. Thank you so much, um, both of you, <laughs> Julie, for that mini presentation, and Chen Yun for the talk um, about 51 Personae, specifically the story of uh, Mrs. Chung and um, Jing Yun Lee. Um, I was really, um, I, so a, a little bit of background. I've, I'm, I know I'm familiar with this story because I helped edit uh, a paper that. Chen Yun wrote on on this project, and um, I, what I hadn't thought about though was actually from the documentation, the f- the door frame, and I, I really enjoyed this part of it actually thinking about the door frame a, as sort of a, a setting for a performance of sorts and the different subjects that kind of appear, reappear, disappear, and and. I I don't know, maybe I'm just making something into art that isn't or shouldn't be and otherwise, and this is sort of always what curators try to do is sort of capture things as uh, an aesthetic sort of, you know, object for consideration. Uh, but uh, I'm, I'm curious if we can get back to the question of art, institution of art with the capital A, um, how, um, how have you presented this project? Let's say, I know you were recently in Korea presenting on Ding Hai Chao. Um, how do you frame this as related to art, as its relationship vis-a-vis the probably only global art institution in Shanghai, which is the Shanghai Biennale? I'm, I'm very curious how this gets tied in and then represented in various institutions of an art discussion. Uh, so when I share this um, 51 Personae and Ding Hai Chao with uh, abroad, for example, or with other uh, other group, um, audiences, uh, international audiences especially, um, they will, uh, in fact, they immediately um, feel very attracted by the stories and the visual things that I present. If, of course, it's not the, the kind of visual experience that you expect from an art exhibition, but um, uh, but because th- why I was in- invited um, by these occasions is because there are other people who are doing almost like the same thing. Uh, while I was presenting it in Kwonju, uh, there are people from Korea, 
from Busan, from uh, from Tokyo, uh, and from Hanoi, uh, from other parts of Asian cities, and mo and it's very specifically city-based that these people, these artists from different generations, or musicians from different generations, who has been devoting themselves in a certain way of organizing things through through art, but through art meaning means not by just doing art or doing it in an artistic way. It's more than that. Uh, through using art as a symbol or using art as a truth, using art as a, as a history, or using art as a, as a human, human sense. So uh, because in this kind of panels why I was invited, each of us will present part of the story from their own life history and situation context today in the city. So we feel that we are uh, we are praying that something that can talk to each other, and I think this kind of form is very interesting. I see occasions when uh, some of their works were presented in a part in an exhibition. Uh, they do they do have such chances to uh, to work as an artist, and they were given a certain space in the exhibition hall, and they will talk about certain things, but. Um, I feel mostly uh, it's not very successful or it's not easy to be achieved because a practice of years, how can that be transformed into an exhibition for you to see uh, for maybe 10 minutes or 30 at most? <laughs> not possible, no, I think five minutes. So this is a big issue. It has always been haunting them. But in fact, if you take into consideration like publications they have been doing, in fact, uh, the publications including the posters of the events, as a record, or, or the kind of short videos they made, and the photos they have. Of course, we need proper archiving, and it's a big headache for every, every one of them to have extra labor to archive. But uh, I think uh, exhibition can have other forms. I think I can only say that at, uh, when they are uh, they faced with such uh, artist um, practices. And also, I want to. I missed another example. Uh, we sometimes talk about interactions in art. We sometimes um, will forget uh, what is the interaction. So, sorry, the first time you see the gate, mm -hmm. uh, it's here. Oh, sorry, it's here, right? You see, this is the first time we printed uh, this amplified wood print on the wall. So it is an empty wall. There's nothing on that. And one month after, uh, mm. there is something on that, on, uh, exactly on the eye part. So <laughs> that this figure who is, who is trying to cover her his eyes from seeing and um, seeing struggling. Um, the, this is a post, this is from the police station, saying that this area is under 24 hours CCTV. So this is a very normal post. They post anywhere uh, as long as they have. Uh, and, uh, of course, they had art of the CCTV. And they somehow, uh, consciously or unconsciously, they feel this part, this eye part, uh, is the most ideal part to put this uh, notice on, saying that uh, now this area is under 24 hour CCTV. And after one year, something new happened. You see, now this 24 hour CCTV notice is removed and has been moved to the other side, which is not that important already. Um, and what is more important is by the, I think it's by, by the district level government or the street level government, they add a, a label saying that this is Jingming. Everybody knows this is Jingming, but they want to add an extra label saying that this is Jingming, and they list it in bilingual, one two lines in Chinese and two lines in English about the historical um, significance of Jimmy, which is of course like, uh, who has lived here. And this is the longer, um, so this is also an interaction. I think this interaction happens because so this strong visual, uh, visual, uh, visual representation of this figure, the artwork of Zhao Yanyan on Lu Xun's uh, novel, Although they try to demolish it, but not very successfully for some reason, they just they just keep keep the, the eye and the, these kind of gesture is so strong that they 
have to go around with it. Play around. They have to play around. And this is something happened because we did the first layer of art, or you can call it an artistic action. But the later, it has been so ac activated by the other side of the readership, which is the the audience. And in this case, the government is also the audience. So they are interacting with this wall once and once again. Because they are also part of the public as well. Oh, definitely, yes. Um, do we have someone here that wants to share an update with us? Yes. most updated additional information about the neighborhood um, and maybe to have a uh, year old of lady, yeah, the picture of her and Chen Yu will do the translation for him Artistic sites, artist sites, 
all of the nonprofit sites and the ind autonomous independent sites I've located, they are private, meaning the government does not fund a single one of these sites. It all comes out of one private person, usually. A lot like what uh, Chen Yun was saying, Ding Hai Chao started with Johnson Chang, who's actually, oh, was Tevis. Uh, again, it's a research consortium, but it was funded by a gallerist from Hong Kong who had a vested interest and who was, you need money in order to fund it. Now, many of these sites that tend to close down are artist-run sites. Unfortunately, the most wealthiest of the artists in China, of which the most famous being, who is it? Most famous Chinese artist in the world. I wait, wait. But he's not interested in funding an artist site. So this tends to be grassroots level. And at a grassroots level, many of them are, are don't have a lot of money. It, it, it becomes this aspiration and this endeavor. And again, it's what Chen Yun said, having its life cycle, which tends to be short. Now the other, the black, the ones that are in black, they're still continuing to go on but they are funded uh, through private endeavors. In regards to public funding in China, the ones that we have are, are as you can see, not many. I didn't include Shanghai Museum in here, because Shanghai Museum, um, they mostly possess classical antiquity. So what I was looking at was more conventional, modern art forms. And there's only, at this point, four compared to all the private museums. I think the government wishes to build significant museums, but many of them tend to be still where the central party is located, which is in Beijing. Beijing has quite a bit more public and uh, government-funded museums than here in Shanghai. Um, the museums in which the government is responsible for, uh, they have achieve success. Uh, it depends really upon the exhibition as opposed to an institution. A fine example would be the Paris Station of Art. And that's where they hold the Shanghai Biennale and they are willing to be able to support projects such as Chen Yun's 51 Persona. That did not find a voice through the private museums. That actually happened with the public museums. But it really, I have to say, it's uh, exhibition driven, not institution driven. But that's an excellent question. Thanks for addressing that. Any other comments, questions? Can I just, oh, did you have one? Okay, here. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I just kind of, so the, So at the start of your talk, you mentioned that the homes that are the home that's preserved is Lucian's former home. So then, what you're doing by documenting this space is not an act of preservation. But the documentation is is creating kind of, is is art in itself. That's that's the art is the documentation. But it's not a work of preservation. Um, I guess I'm kind of wondering though if, like, there's also this, there's an attempt to provide a benefit to the community through this process of creating documentation art. Um, but I guess, do you worry that there's a risk that it just becomes another kind of preservation um, without a direct community benefit? Or do you feel that? Like the community benefit is sort of inevitable. It's an inevitable result of the care and attention that the documentation art provides the space. Um, I think it is because the form of presentation is through uh, PPT um, that you see a lot of documentation, uh, like uh, photos and images in this presentation. In fact, there have been a lot of uh, discussions and actions going on behind these photos. 
And for um, example, before Mr. Chang decided to do the Nifty Workers Forum, the conversation between us is very important because it is a proposal. I need to make sure that it is not like I need to make sure. It is about to make it work. It has to be uh, an initiative. Of course, it started from me as an invitation, but it has to be finally an initiative of both of us, especially the one who is the fifth person. She will take a certain uh, initiative uh, in it, so that because we don't have the funding to 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 give money to the person themselves, um, so they have to make to it has to make sense to themselves. So uh, throughout the process of the drama Sunday, I need to mention today, uh, I, this one principle, it becomes a principle because later on I figured that this is a principle, uh, which is that um, everyone who participated in this thing will take initiative for themselves. So it will not become, well, of course we have a lot of, we can have a lot of discussions. We try our best to understand each other. But the initiative has to be, the decision has to be made by uh, each of themselves. Of course, we can discuss, but the decision has to be made by themselves so that they will be within this thing that they do instead of they later become uh, a state, a state, uh, an event, and they later figure, well, it is like a dream, or well, how come I did it? No, it's not possible because they won't be puzzled that how come I did it. They, they definitely should have done it. Uh, either it's a performance or what. For example, I give another case of Victor Persone, who is a former um, um, that is uh, acrobat, yes, acrobat performer, uh, and who won the world top prize. But he quit the state from company because his whole life started to be trained as an acrobat from like five or 10 years old. And he is very fed up by this state system that imposes the state uh, uh, ideology he thinks on him. So he quit acrobat. But in his one person, we asked a former collaborator of his who is um, a circus runner, but who is a, uh, in his, 70s and 80s who belong to the hippies generation who think circus is a form for popular art. So he came uh, through some sponsorship from the Swiss Foundation to Shanghai again and meet him after so many years and they work together for another performance. So I very much want to make sure that the acrobat himself had enjoyed this performance, which is so that he is not performing for others. He has to perform for himself. So how I checked this, because after one year, um, this, uh, um, this circus uh, director come back again from Switzerland, and we had a dinner together, and this uh, former acrobat, this young man, he told, me, he told me that after we hosted this Victor One Persone performance, his come back to the, uh, come back to the stage acrobat performance, which is only like 10 minutes in Power Station of Art, he said, you know, after that, within one month, I shut down my own business. Earlier, he was running a business by training younger people, younger kids, uh, acrobat and their bodies, so that they will uh, be recruited to the state schools who is focusing on performance. He said that if I don't believe this kind of system, if I have been persuaded by another way of art creation, then how come I trying to live a life on this kind of training. So he made himself a freelance performer and, uh, and a teacher, a tutor. So he said this performance has changed almost his life because he is now freelanced. So he know that he will have some time, once in a while, maybe once in a couple of years, to, to keep training his bodies once in a while so that he can come back to the stage and work with the circus director again or on some other occasions. Because now he feels that he has this possibility. Earlier, no one will push that on him. In fact, I did push on these people. <laughs> Otherwise, there will be no good to one as events. But after all, they have to be in this role as themselves, and they will find that this, this is part of their life, instead of they 
they became someone else suddenly and they can't recognize. So I think um, these things happened um, uh, behind these photos that you saw also on the um, Especially one, Ms. Chen was, her, her talent was moved out of, removed by force out of the house. It was a shock to everyone. I'm one of us who has observed the whole case since 2016. Um, and it, but we cannot claim that we are an insider as such because we don't have a share in this house. And in this kind of game that was set by the government, we will be confused because you will think that your what was your role? You, you are not a relative. You, you don't have Google in this. And how come you feel so relevant? So 51 persona is also 51 occasions for you to feel relevant to something. And this relevancy is something that the current social structure is trying to prohibit you from thinking about. Because legally or illegally, you are doing this and that because of this kind of right or that kind of obligation. But there are relevances in this society that is very natural to people who know. So if you know and if you're relevant, then this is a very important starting point for 51 Personae. You don't have to be historically related or legally related, but there are certain things that you want to observe, document, participate, or have a say. Um, but of course, on the other hand, um, in this social media period, it's easy for you to feel relevant and feel irrelevant again. Uh, so also 51 percent of the structure, I think, it because I feel it could be a project. So if it is a project, then at least I will feel that at a certain point, you cannot easily leave it. For example, if you have already known and you already said, then there should be something grow up. There is a certain expectation uh, followed by this relevancy. And this is something I think this society uh, will find hoping. Yeah, okay. Thanks so much. That was a really great response. Um, last question. We have time for one question. Last question. Response? Comments? I wanted to ask about uh, a sense I have about a shift that's taking place in Shanghai art uh, scene, and I'm wondering if it's just that my perception is changing, or whether there's a real underlying shift, which is that I've, I've noticed in the last couple of years an increasing number of very autonomous spaces emerging, like exhibitions in, like literally in people's apartments that they would convert into a gallery for a weekend, or performances of various kinds in spaces that are not official in any sense. They're private spaces. Information spreads through word of mouth. I'm wondering whether is that a real underlying shift, or is it just that I'm sort of making better friends these days and getting better invitations and uh, places to go? Um, nothing new. In fact, Professor Gaoming Lu over at uh, University of Pittsburgh has been writing about a phenomenon called apartment art that's been happening in Beijing's Dongcheng East Village that began from the 1990s. It's this idea that, especially here in China, when you're constantly under surveillance, as you saw, there was a CCTV camera even put up, Ms. Chen was right outside her house, um, that in this sense of a private home is where you can have this sense of artistic as well as performative or visual or aural, that sense of freedom, because within this at this private space, the, the government bureau censors cannot intrude as they can in exhibition space where there are hierarchies of, of oversight that happens. So I think in China, it's always been this idea of what Professor Gaming Lu calls apartment art. It's historical, and I think it's historically unique here in China just because there's a sense of a protected space. Um, I feel the same way as you, in a sense that I got here in 2011, and it was really when I got on WeChat that I started finding out about all this underground pop-up, a two-hour sound art exhibition, mm -hmm. and I thought I was just getting more into it. And when I talked to a sound artist, he said, no, Julie, it's always been around. It's just that now you've got better access, and of course, the longer you live here, the greater network of local friends that you established and that information. But again, I think that's another layer that 
of course, we don't have time to explore tonight, but something for us to think about as we leave this space is, is how this idea of the public space is reinterpreted when we get into this realm of social media and how that plays into the idea of performative as well as shared information in regards to art. This also answers the question why in Fifty One Fasone there is only one uh, foreigner. Well, is foreigner a bad word? It's uh, expat? <laughs> yes, <laughs> expat. Okay. 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 Okay.
51 personae. Um, is there a possibility of a publication or a book or a website or something that we can sort of Thank you all again. Thank you to Julie and uh, Chen Yun for.